With CPKC's massive rail network that spans across three countries in North America, you can only imagine the vast history involved with each single mile. As you go down the family tree, you can go down a heavy rabbit hole of research of every railroad that makes it up. On the KCS side of the family, one railway sticks out among the rest. While its unique identity was stripped decades before, it operated as a subsidiary of the Kansas City Southern all the way up until 1992. The formation and story of how the railroad formed and grew is truly a remarkable one. And today I hope you'll join me in telling this story of what once was the Louisiana and Arkansas Railway. As the steel roads increased their reach across the continental United States, the country overall experienced rapid growth, but on the other hand, areas that were bypassed by the right-of-way were faced with the risk of becoming ghost towns, and this was exactly the case for Minden, Louisiana. In the early 1880s, the Vicksburg, Shreveport, and Pacific had announced plans to build a rail route to connect the two major cities of North Louisiana, Shreveport and Monroe. After many changes of ownership, this route would eventually become part of today's CPKC Meridian Speedway. Anyway, the plans for the route would not include running through Minden, but instead, five miles to the south in the community of Lanesville, which was renamed to its current name of Sibley. Instead of waiting for the eventual death of Minden, a short line would be chartered to connect with the VSP main line. In the summer of 1884, the VSNP had reached Lanesville and construction of the newly formed Minden Railroad and Compress Company began and was completed by November of the same year. The small road would be nicknamed the Minden Tap. Meanwhile up north in Arkansas, sawmills were popping up left and right to join into the very profitable timber industry. In 1891, William Buckingham would become president of one of these operations, the Bodcaw Lumber Company located in Stamps, Arkansas. The Texas and St. Louis, which would later end up as a cotton belt line, and after that a UP line, was building its main line right through Stamps as it connected the cities of Pine Bluff and Texarkana. Timber was a major driving force in the construction of new rail lines in both states of Arkansas and Louisiana and William Buckingham is just one of many who would build rails to serve the needs of his massive mill. Buckingham and the Bodcaw Lumber Company would build south out of Stamps towards the several logging camps in the mid-1890s and would eventually start advertising passenger service along with freight. In January of 1896, advertisements would appear with the first known reference to the name Louisiana and Arkansas Railway. On October 23, 1897, the Arkansas, Louisiana, and Southern was chartered to build north out of Minden. This newly formed ALNS would acquire the Minden Tap Railroad in 1898. As Buckingham's railroad continued to grow southward in the same year, he had scouts in the Louisiana forest to purchase land for timber. While I couldn't find any official agreement documentation in my research, it was obvious that both his LNA and the ALNS would build to connect their routes. July 9, 1898. The final spike is driven, and now Stamps, Arkansas, and Sibley, Louisiana were connected, compiling a total of 60 miles of mainline track, which does not include a few logging branch lines, such as one that ran east from Taylor, Arkansas, to Emerson, Arkansas. By December, another charter was amended to allow extension southward out of Sibley. The main line would begin to take an L shape with notable locations such as Winfield, Alexandria, and Natchez, Mississippi. In the early days of expansion in 1900, the AL and S would officially be absorbed into the LNA. While expanding southward, the railroad would also have several other small expansions in other directions. One was being north out of the origin point of Stamps towards Hope, Arkansas, where the LNA would connect with the St. Louis and Iron Mountain, a predecessor of the Missouri Pacific. Another would be through purchasing the Minden East and West Railway, which was in progress of connecting the city of Shreveport with Minden. This line was 29 miles in length, even though trackage rights had to be arranged with the Cotton Belt for a few miles to reach Shreveport. This would lead to Buckingham building a new rail terminal in Shreveport. 
Central Station with Cotton Belt and the LNA, utilizing it over the previously constructed Union Station right down the road. It opened in 1911, and passenger service for the LNA skyrocketed. Now the railroad was a serious competitor with other nearby roads such as the Texas and Pacific and the Louisiana Railway and Navigation Company. Passenger trains would run to the growing city of Alexandria from Treeport and to its northern end at Hope, Arkansas. By 1914, the railroad had a total of 273 miles of rail. The Buckingham family would run a tight ship for the following years and never had an overall deficit year excluding 1918 and 1919 when the government controlled the railroad during World War I. William Buckingham would pass the torch of controlling the LNA to his son, W.J. Buckingham, at the time of his death in 1923. The son would not want to continue in the steps of his father for terribly long as the family would want to sell the railroad as the timber industry that built it would begin to die down. A man by the name of Harvey Couch would enter the picture with a group of investors tagging along. Couch had an extensive background in many industries such as the railroads, telephone lines, and the electricity field. This syndicate would take control of both the LNA and the Louisiana Railway and Navigation Company in 1928, while the official charter of approval was in February of 1929. This would form what many call the new LNA. This new and improved Louisiana and Arkansas came with a new slogan, LNA, the better way. Beforehand, both companies were fiercely competitive with each other, with much of their main lines paralleling, although the LRNN would decide to head for New Orleans instead of Natchez. The LRNN would also have a Texas line that connected Shreveport into East Texas near Dallas. This route was simply named the Texas line by the LRNN. Due to the Texan laws at the time, the Texas line would have to be chartered as a separate entity so the Louisiana, Arkansas, and Texas was formed. The L.A. and T. spanned from Wascom, Texas to McKinney, and trackage rights were necessary for the final stretch of miles into both Dallas and Shreveport. While under a different name, it was essentially still the LNA, but the Texan law at the time dictated that railroads in Texas must be headquartered in Texas. While the timber industry was the initial driving force of this railroad, the petroleum booms of the 1920s would quickly take its place as the top commodity hauled. Couch also sought to expand business out of New Orleans to send to surrounding areas out of Dallas, though much work had to be done on the several stretches of the rundown LRNN Texas line. And to be honest, the line never really prospered. Couch would also begin dedicated passenger service from Shreveport to Hope, Arkansas, fittingly titled the Shreveporter, which would run faster than your typical local service. The only stops on the run would be Minden, Cotton Valley, Stamps, and finally Hope. Along with the Shreveporter came the Hustler, which connected New Orleans and Baton Rouge with Shreveport. Throughout several years of overall good fortune, the LNA was truly making a name for itself and acquired several heavy Mikado-type steam locomotives in 1936. While the LNA had a decent roster of locomotives throughout its history, these M22 class, or more commonly referred to as the 560 classes, were very impressive for such a small road. These locomotives could pull up to 2,900 tons of freight over the system's toughest grades. By 1937, Couch had gained an interest of a familiar road to many of you and began acquiring several shares of the Kansas City Southern. This would eventually land him a position on the KCS Board of Directors in which he would begin planting the ideas of the system combining to others. By 1939, the president of KCS had retired, and Harvey used this opportunity to get his brother Pete, who had been by his side for much of his struggles and success of the LNA, into the role. The ICC approved the merger between the KCS and the LNA. It's also worth noting that the Texas line, or the LANT, was also brought into the newly combined system. The ICC would claim victory over the Texas State Attorney. While the railroad wouldn't be headquartered in Texas, the KCS and LNA would have to keep the Greenville shops open. Despite being under the same parent company, the early years of the combination would find both KCS and the LNA as separate entities. 
In fact, the new logo would feature both railroads in it, and both were listed in everything from financial reports to advertisements for passenger service. The late 1930s and continuing on into the 1940s would find railroads across the U.S. introducing top-of-the-line streamliner passenger service. The KCS LNA lines would introduce their own service from Kansas City to New Orleans, the Southern Bell. As the years went on, the LNA would continue to be reported as a separate entity from the KCS, but beginning in the 1950s, the identity of it slowly faded with time as the famous KCS Octagon logo replaced the combined logo between the two railroads. By the 1960s, the LNA wouldn't be listed in any of the annual reports, and it would all be under the KCS name. This may get me some flag, but I consider this the end of the LNA history. The better way existed on paper until it was finally dissolved in 1992, and plenty of events happened on its former system throughout the years that preceded that. And that's why I'm going to recommend this book here, written by James R. Fair. It's truly a fascinating read, and it's where I got the majority of the information in this video. It also includes a deep look into the LRNN, and I'm debating on making a dedicated video to it as well. I really hope you enjoyed this video essay on the LNA. It's often an overlooked component of the history of the KCS and now CPKC. Its legacy is still seen today with the main line connecting New Orleans and also its former right of way between Shreveport and Wiley that hosts a large amount of intermodal traffic. Leave a like down below if you did enjoy this video and consider subscribing if you haven't already. Until the next time my friends, I'll be seeing you somewhere out there along the rails. And as always, thanks for watching.